Today, I'm going to run you through a bit of detail around what it is we're doing in federal government IT procurement and the broader uh, procurement space. Now, I think I do a fair bit of public speaking, and whenever I'm trying to come together and, and work out what I'm going to say, I find it useful to get a theme. And my theme today is the five captains. And some of you will know that, indeed, today, um, the next version of the Star Trek movie series is opening. And I've been looking for an opportunity to build that into what it is that I'm going to say. So I'm going to trace the work that we're doing and map them for you against the five captains um, that, that, picture, that feature in the Star Trek movie series. And I hope you'll find that something to jog your thinking um, in the future. First of all, let me just tell you what are the things that I look after in whole of government procurement and services. I look after the 150,000 kilometres of um, fibre optic cable that run, run around Canberra, the ministerial communications network that sits on top of that, that goes to the states and territories as well as Canberra, the, telecommunica the telepresence system that runs on top of that, some 40 telepresence rooms in states and territories and federally in Canberra that cover um, the allow people to use that secret network to discuss things um, if they need to. We get a lot of use um, out of that. I provide whole-of-government procurement for desktop hardware, internet-based network connections, mobile phones, data centres, major office machines, stationary and office services, um, domestic airline travel, international airline travel, travel management companies, credit cards, fleet management, hire cars, hotel accommodation. I provide australia.gov.au, the online services, a range of collaboration things both inside and outside government that sit on those same online services. And and finally, I'm in charge of procurement policy. And I'm going to cover some of those things in our discussion today. Um, it's, I've got a really good team of um, great people that support the work we do, some 200 staff. Uh, and it allows us to, I, I think, get the benefits, we, the best benefits we can out of the, the general whole of government procurement uh, way of doing things. And we also work with the states and territories um, to try and get benefits um, across the whole of the Commonwealth. I am going to talk about five captains, but I'm going to start with the person who's most logical because I think I, I find that I need to get across um, something that's really important. Martin Parkinson, the Secretary of the Treasury, um, Steve Sedgwick, the Head of the Public Service, the Government generally have spoken about the financial situation in which the Commonwealth currently is. And a lot of the time when I deal with um, suppliers, it seems to me that they don't understand the challenges that this provides us. In 2008, we had Sir Peter Gershon do a review of IT, procure, IT across um, the federal government. He made seven recommendations. I was in charge of implementing a couple of those. The one that you will most often have heard about, of course, is the business as usual budget reduction work. And we took a billion dollars worth of spending out of um, government department baselines, 15 per cent, over four years and then ongoing because it's a baseline reduction. What we did was reduce business as usual spending without affecting the delivery of services to um, clients, citizens or business. And that meant that the ICT budgets of the major, the small and, oh, sorry, the large and medium departments were reduced by you know, 15 and 7.5% and respectively. That's a lot of money. It, what it means is there isn't money floating around in IT budgets to pick up on you know, possible new ideas, changes that might occur, things like that. There's a lot of pressure on making sure that we spend the money we have wisely and we continue to do that. Now, actually, the breakup um, isn't as bad as some people think. We're spending consistently um, over $5 billion a year on government IT. We, our ratio of running the business to growing the business is sort of in the high 60s to, to what is obviously then the low 30s. Um, if you think of the sort of historic ratios that people see as workable, the 70-30 ratio is sort of as desirable, um, we're in pretty good shape as far as that goes. It varies year to year as the larger projects that some agencies do um, sort of wax and wane, but certainly I think we're in the right space in the sort of run um, versus build area. We are concentrating a lot more these days on buying rather than 
um, building. So the, uh, we've got a couple of policies that address this. Um, one is called the Bespoke Development Policy, but we think of it as the COTS GOTS policy, which essentially says you should buy off the shelf when you can do it. And I think what we're seeing as a change in the IT marketplace is the pressure on people to buy off the shelf, to make do with the best sort of efficiencies they can get and not spend, sometimes not pursue the sort of diminishing returns you get at the top end of customisation in order to do that. These are real pressures on government and I'm sure, I'm sure you understand that but as, as I said I just want to emphasise that this, is, this push for efficiency is very, very important to us. Now, um, some of you, um, perhaps um, the more mature of you, would remember that um, the first Captain Kirk used to deal with two sorts of planets in the, series, in the series. Red planets in which he killed the aliens and green planets in which he slept with the aliens. Now, this... <laughs> This, this balance it, it suggests, because of my sort of technology and procurement responses, that, that responsibilities, that I have some sort of difficult relationship too. You know, uh, there's the red vendor planet and there's the green agency planet. Now, it isn't actually like that. We've got to run these things together and we know that we have to work with suppliers in order to get the outcomes we want. We know because of the changes in the way IT is being managed across the world, not just in government, that the pressure for CIOs is not to be a blocker of IT services, but rather a broker of IT services. To address the issues that say the CIO doesn't necessarily have to have one data centre with all the applications sitting it sitting in it, all built the same way, all doing the same things. That's changing because of the pressures of cloud and other things. I'm going to touch on some of those as we move along. But it really is a change in the way that CIOs have to work. And I think we, I would say, and you know, you're probably thinking, well, of course he'd say that. I would say that we recognise we need to deal with suppliers in a different way in order to, to make sure we take advantage of the situation that presents itself here. Because if we don't, we risk a whole range of unfortunate behaviour. And I'm sure many of you who've dealt with large IT shops will appreciate that behaviour. Uh, and without picking on any um, major software companies at all, I would remind you, of course, of the difficulty of dealing with corporate data when it was in hundreds or thousands of Lotus Notes databases and then we moved to put it into hundreds and thousands of Microsoft Access databases and then we put it into a range of SharePoint instances around the organisation and now I'm sure that we're putting it into cloud applications in the public cloud, maybe in the private cloud, in a range of places. Unless CIOs are on top of that and making sure we know where the corporate data is, we're going to have problems in the future. And of course the nature of being a CIO is that if this happens, business will have done it but it'll be the CIO's fault or the CIO's problem to fix it. And I think anyone who's approaching their job um, cleverly in IT at the moment recognises those difficulties and wants to get on top of it early. So I think that's important. Um, Commander Data was one of the members of Jean-Luc Picard's crew on Star Trek um, The Next Generation. Um, some of you might know that um, Data was essentially a robot, a cyborg, depending on how you want to explain it. And obviously, aside from having no emotions, which of course is no bad thing for a CIO, um, <laughs> he, also, he also had... Um, you know, a computer-like brain and could remember things. Now, what we're seeing, I, I think, in the, the data space in IT across the world at the moment, but certainly in government, here in Queensland, but certainly federally as well, is the recognition that we need to be more transparent, that we need to put data out where people can see it and understand what we're doing. So, one of the things that we did in February this year Published on data.gov.au, the, all the Oz tender data, which by the way was already in the public domain, you could search through it um, somewhat laboriously if you wanted to, but we published all the, IT, the, all the contracting data, federal contracting data, not just IT, back to 1999 on data.gov.au in accessible format so people can look at that data and make something of it check and see what's being spent, look at the trends and those sorts of things. The notion that this is data we already have, as I said, and you can review um, Oztender to find it, but this allows people, journalists, people who are interested, people who want to build their university theses on it, whatever, to access the data and see what is happening.
Now, there are other things that are affecting how we deal with public data as well. To, to address that, we're rebuilding the data.gov.au platform, using a, put it, putting it onto a CCAN platform, um, which is a better way of accessing it. It will allow um, agencies to automatically create APIs for their data, so people will be able to then link to that data online and use it in a live sense, re recognising that this, some of this data isn't data that changes minute to minute. Some of it only changes week to week or, or, or month to month. But to use that, connect to that data and use use it um, for whatever purposes. Some of these purposes can be um, commercial. The most, one of the most accessed data sets on data.gov.au now is the National Public Toilet Data Map. Um, now, you're probably thinking why, um, and I'm not sure I know the answer to that either, but I do know that a range of commercial providers use that information to provide geographical data sets, um, you know, sort of what's on things, that sort of arrangement, so that people can find the, the closest public toilet when they need to. Now, we've come a long way in the use of that data since we first put that up in um, early 2010. The challenges we had at that time were the notion that lawyers would say, well, what if the toilet is closed? Will someone sue us because they've had some you know, difficulty using it? What if someone mashes up that data with something else and creates you know, difficult you know, challenges for us? We've got over those things, I think, largely. The work of the Office of the Australian Information Commissioner, the changes we have in releasing data, both FOI data and other data, means that people recognise recognise now we can put things out that people can use and make better use of. And I encourage you to look at those things, um, particularly as a supplier, to use the Oz Tender, the Tenders database, um, to look, at, get alerts on those things and understand what government is doing. Now I'm sure very many of you are doing that already, but it's probably the most critical step in order to find out what's going on. It isn't a sufficient step though. As is often said, if the first time you hear about a tender is when you see it advertised, you're not gonna win it. You need to be more engaged with agencies and with government than that. Now, I have a lot of sympathy for Benjamin Sisko. He was the captain who ran, who ran um, Deep Space Nine, the, the sort of space station out there on the edge of the um, Alpha Quadrant, dealing with um, making the whole thing run. And I, the, one of the reasons I have sympathy with him is because he didn't generally get to fly around in the starships meeting um, people and getting to do exciting things. He had to keep the lights running at home. Um, additional responsibilities came to him and he didn't get any more pay, and I have some sympathy with that as well. Um, the, the challenge for him, and it's the challenge for many CIOs now, is keeping the lights on when things are difficult. And a lot of our work remains in finding better ways to do that. Ways to capitalise on benefits that we've already found. If you take, for example, the... Um, the desktop hardware panel. When we began the work on the desktop hardware panel, we were paying, the Australian government was paying about 55% more than the Australian average for standard desktop computers. We now pay about 50% less than the Australian average for desktop computers. A turnaround in price of some 60 to 70%. Um, percent, reducing the price so much for agencies that, for example, leasing options are rarely considered now because the cost of adding the cost of money to the cost of the computer has has sort of made it that too, too expensive an option. Agencies can afford to get standard PCs at really good prices. Now many of you would know that some of that is the effect of the market generally um, as well. As we've got better computers, we're now in the situation where the computer you buy you know, at Harvey Norman in a, in a shop generally has all the technology you need or most public servants need to do all their work all the time. So we've got a bit of a benefit in doing that. But we've got a large benefit in talking about competition and getting better prices in this context of competition across um, from a range of suppliers. Now we extend the ability to use this panel to the states and territories. Um, some have taken it up, um, others are considering it. We buy I think an average of 7,000 um, odd computers a quarter um, through, this, through this panel and obviously that gives us significant benefits in terms of um, price but also by going out regularly and getting best and final offers we find that competition is getting a good effect um, in the market. In um, 
uh, internet-based network connections. What we found is that um, agencies, because of the pressure on them, would regularly renew their, um, their contract with an with a, um, internet provider uh, and at the last minute. And the provider would often say, look, we know you're having a bit of a hard time here. We'll give you a bit of extra capability, a bit of extra capacity. We won't charge you any more for it. You can just keep paying what it is you were paying before. And agencies, you know, that, that, as I say, under a lot of pressure, say, well, that's all right. I'm getting better value for money than I was, so I'll move on that. What we found is that as a consequence of that, the prices that the federal government was, were paying was falling behind the price that we were paying publicly. So again, by introducing central competition and quoting for internet-based network connections, we've reduced the price sometimes by rolling the service over, the, the current provider, from the current service to the terms and conditions of internet-based network connections, has reduced the price by more than 50%. No change in capacity, or sometimes an increase in capacity, but a 50% reduction. When we put out wider quotes, we often find that the quotes are 70% um, reduced as a consequence of this. This is the only, interestingly, this is the only one that we put back to budget, the savings back to budget. We had a target of $55 million over four years. We have achieved that target in, six, in, in five years, which isn't the complete achievement, of course, um, but we're well on track to do that, and we're consistently getting um, good results. What does this mean for the behaviour of agencies? Well, all agencies, and I'm sure all of us have that same um, sort of effect, no one really likes central control of things. Um, everyone would often prefer to do their own things. But what we're finding is in the face of these considerable discounts, we're getting changed behaviour. Agencies recognise that they can get better deals centrally than they can if they pursue them um, individually, um, in, in, on an individual agency basis. Now, by the way, we have a cabinet mandate to make them do that, so um, it's something of a, you know, you know it's, it's not much of a choice. But we are finding a lack of resistance now to the notion of doing this as they start to see the benefits of doing this business as usual work better. And that's, that I think has been an important challenge change in the way we've looked at these things. I could go on about the savings in data centre facilities, about the savings in mobile phones, like mobile phone carriage, and, and that's been useful. We've had a couple of things though that haven't worked quite so well. Our original mobile phone panel provided accessories, hardware, handsets, and carriage. We found that no one was buying the accessories, um, simply First of all, people generally didn't buy them, or if they wanted accessories, they'd go down to the local Crazy Johns or something like that and get the cover they liked or the screen protector they wanted because it was easier than going through a panel arrangement. We also found that unlike um, the, the purchasing of um, desktop computers or, or, or computers generally, people purchased handsets not in hundreds or thousands but in ones or tens and as a consequence of that, despite the fact that we had very solid warranty conditions, good return to base conditions, all the sort of government things that you'd expect us to have, people didn't use the panel very much because like all of us do, um, if your phone breaks, the notion that you'll have a guaranteed repair of it in six weeks doesn't help you very much, you need the phone today. Um, and that change has meant that we've had to look at what we're doing and say, how can we improve it? So we've, we, we put a freeze. We took accessories out completely. That wasn't achieving anything. We put a freeze on the desktop hardware, the um, mobile phone handset part of the panel, continued data carriage, which was producing good results. I've seen small agencies get half an FTE benefit a year as a consequence of changing um, their uh, moving under the new, um, new plans. So we're getting good benefits there and we're starting to look at what we can do to improve that business as usual work. Now, I'm not pretending that this is sort of high-tech innovation. This is just better procurement practice. We've done good work with Microsoft software. We've had a competition for the large account reseller. Um, Data3 here in Queensland has won that um, tender arrangement two, two, two times in a row and is providing us really good service. And also providing us the leverage that we need to work with Microsoft to reduce the prices we're paying there. We've saved $100 million off government depricing in the last four years. And that's a really, I, I think, important benefit that most 
most agencies couldn't have got previously. We've been able to move software in the core desktop licence area between agencies as their numbers have gone up and down, and that in itself has saved us $3 million or something like that. So we've got lots of benefits of doing this centrally. But what we've stuck with is infrastructure. Now, I'm of the very strong belief that you can build, if you have one business process, you can build one system to support it. And if you've got multiple business processes, you can build multiple systems to support them. But if you have multiple business processes and try and build one system to support them, then you get the sort of bad acronym for CIO, career is over, because the CIO is forced to push business change through the organisation and that rarely works. So we, centrally in the work that I do, we stay out of that application layer generally, stay out of the business part of it, but look instead at the common infrastructure structure, the shared things that we can get um, that way. And I think it's been relatively successful to date. Now, the next challenge for us is um, the, the challenge that faced Captain Janeway in the Voyager. Sailing along, um, if that's the, what spaceships do, cruising along in the Alpha Quadrant, quite happy, no particular problems, on a mission normally. Next thing you know, the entire vessel is in the Delta Quadrant trying to get home. Dealing with the uncertainty of that is what is changing the way that we are doing business. It's a particular challenge for us. Now, aside from, I mean, we know that there's going to be an election um, in September. It, it, aside from who um, wins that election, change is always going to happen in those circumstances. And we have to, in, in IT and procurement, continue to deliver services in the face of that potential change and be ready to adopt to the sorts of things that are doing. We do a lot of work in our, in our panel preparation in terms of making sure we understand the market. And I'm going to talk to you now about the data centre strategy and the work that we did in that. But first I'm going to get a glass of water. It's very humid up here. We began the data centre strategy work actually before Gershon had done his work in 2008. But he identified that if we bought data centres in a more coordinated way, we could avoid costs to the tune of a um, billion dollars over 10 to 15 years. So we put in place a data centre strategy which we announced in March 2010. However, we had to do a lot of work to get to that. We did three independent studies one of technology and trends, one of demand and one of supply to understand what it is that we needed to do. And we got some very clear indications. Firstly, we got an indication that data centre facilities providers wanted to, would give us discounts or substantial discounts if we bought in 500 square metre blocks and if we bought 10-year leases. Now, think back to sort of that, that late 2009. Cloud computing was something that you generally read about in airline magazines rather than in tech magazines. And although you would have people come back to talk to you about doing it, it wasn't being sold largely in Australia. So it was pretty reasonable to do that. Just at the end of the work, literally as we were about to launch the strategy, I got some feedback that said, actually, it'd be good if you also had a view of selling by power, so a 500 kilowatt um, minimum limit would be useful as well because some people are now starting to sell on the basis of power rather than on the basis of space. So I put that in the policy. A couple of years later we've got um, more than 20 potential providers of data centres around Australia but we're starting to see the market change. Agencies are buying small bits of outsourced data centre. And as a consequence, we've done some work with our providers to provide what we call um, consortia contracts, where finance, my department, signs the contract, but it's based on bringing together a whole lot of small agencies to get to that 500 um, kilowatt uh, limit or, or floor to get there. But we've also seen that the providers are very keen to provide smaller facilities than that if required. Why? Because they can see the cloud competition 
out there ready to be grabbed by agencies. And they recognise that the market has changed. So what we're doing as a consequence of this is changing the way we're buying this service. We're refreshing our data centre panel, a couple of facilities panel, a couple of years early, and we've also put in place a change to, the, to some of the other things that we can do. Um, this is particularly in the area of what we call the data centre as a service multi-use list. Now this allows agencies to buy cloud and cloud-like services. What we did when we were considering this was we wanted to address this small agency challenge and the ability to use the cloud to quickly get IT services. So we did a lot of broad consultation. Um, we on our blog. Uh, we went out, asked people what they thought. We put a draft contract out there, a draft head agreement. We got people to sign up to it. We do, it's a multi-use list rather than a panel, so you still have to do some work if you wanted to tender off it. But for getting quotes below $80,000, it's a very useful mechanism. We've got some 50-odd providers offering some 1,200 different services. If you just type into your favourite search engine, um, finance data centre as a service multi-use list, you'll already be there. Not only will you, be, will you be able to see the structure of the system, and as I said, it's open for um, regular additions of people, not only will you be able to see the structure of it, but you'll actually be able to see in, a, in an Excel spreadsheet the way that, it, that um, vendors are offering their services. You'll be able to see that they're categorised into things like secure or not secure, protected, whatever, um, the, the level of their SLAs. We didn't say we want these particular SLAs. What we said was we will group your SLA offering into these areas and you just tell us which one you're offering it in. And as a consequence, we put this out in October last year, we've already had 12 contracts signed up, um, totalling about $500,000 um, so far, and we're getting continual interest from agencies to buy quickly small amounts of computing in the cloud to use those things. We offer not just infrastructure as a service, but you can buy platform as a service, software as a service, a range of other things. I mentioned to you that we're um, repositioning data.gov.au. That will be through a public cloud provider offered off the data centre as a service multi-use list. So I encourage you to look at that and see whether there are services that you're offering in that area that might drive um, benefits for you in, in that setup. I want to touch now on my procurement responsibilities or my central procurement policy responsibilities. Um, the first captain of the enterprise um, was actually uh, Jonathan Archer. Now, you have to be fairly deep into Star Trek to understand this um, because he actually preceded um, James Tiberius Kirk and, and drove the first ever um, starship. Now, Archer had some interesting difficulties because he was the one who first sort of ran up against the challenges of the Prime Directive. And the Commonwealth Procurement Rules are like the Prime Directive. The Commonwealth Procurement Rules describe what it is that we have to do when we're buying things. The first principle is the important one of value for money. This doesn't mean the cheapest price. What it does mean is that agencies need to look at the total cost of ownership of a purchase, all the things that they're doing, and make sure they're getting value as a consequence of that. Now, there are a range of other things that are in the Commonwealth Procurement Rules, but I encourage you, if you haven't, to have a look at them. They're actually only 44 pages long. The first five pages say this is a set of rules. The last six pages say here's the index, here's the um, glossary and those sorts of things. There's actually only 33 pages that have got the detail in them. Several of those are pretty cover pages. The font's not that small and the margins are quite big. Um, so, so I do encourage you, it's like it's about three Facebook posts, um, and I, I, I encourage you to have a look at the rules and just see what they mean. Now we're doing, trying to do centrally some extra stuff to help agencies and um, suppliers better understand what the rules are. Shortly we'll be launching a procurement blog, and on the procurement blog we'll publish things like speeches about procurement, um, discussions about procurement. We'll look for suggestions about things that we can do better. We won't be changing the Commonwealth procurement rules. We, when we reissued them last year, we were careful to make them a quite solid generic set of rules so that we didn't have to muck around with the regulations every year or something like that. 
we look at the range of procurement connected policies and there are about 20 odd of those pure procurement connected policies but we're actively working to see how we can do a couple of things firstly what we can reduce do to reduce the complication for agencies so when they sign off on the fact yes I obeyed all the procurement connected policies they can do with do so with greater confidence but also to provide for suppliers the ability to follow a flow chart through and say I'm going to sell to government which of these things do I have to take into account? How does that affect me in those circumstances? And we hope with better, better explanation of this work that we'll be able to drive um, better results. <coughs> the downside of using my iPad, of course, is you can see, you might be able to see the tweets as they come up. I don't know if you noticed that a minute ago. Um, now, back to where we are um, today. The, this is the new James Tiberius Kirk, as I said, being released today um, in Australia, the new version of, of the movie, or the latest version. It's the same story. It's still Kirk, it's still Spock, it's still McCoy, those people are still there, but we're learning more about what they're doing, that's, that's fine. But what we're actually seeing as a consequence of changes in movies is we're seeing the application of better technology to what it is that they are doing so we have a more enjoyable screen experience. The application of new technology to our procurement work is also driving changes. The first and most obvious of these, I think, is cloud computing, and I've touched on that a fair bit. The next is mobility and what we're doing around offering around agencies offering mobile apps for their, their um, customers and for citizens, providing support on the go for people, the recognition that many people with a 54% penetration of smartphones across Australia, um, more internet connections being made, sorry that's internet connections through smartphones, the majority of internet connections being made through, through mobile devices rather than fixed devices, it's changing how we have to offer our services. You can actually go to the um, government online directory, if you go to m.directory.gov.au you will see a handheld version of the directory of all the SES offices in the federal government, you'll be and sort of connected things. You'll be able to search that and find out the the bit of the organisation that you might want to speak to um, easily. It's driving changes in what it is that we're doing. It's also allowing us to do more consulting. Now, many of you will be aware of the challenges that we have had with. Um, probity previously. The probity rules have essentially meant that we were given two choices. We could tell everybody everything or nobody anything. Now I'm sure as a consequence many of you have been to government briefings for tenders in where the briefer has got up and said at the outset of the briefing Nothing I say has any, is of any consequence because if it isn't written down in the documents we've already released, that's what counts. Nothing else is important. Um, and then, indeed, of course, we have the, you know, the flip side of the coin where you provide you know, the briefing that you've been working on, the sort of tender you've been baking now for six months or something like that. You had a whole team on it and you get up and you say, are there any questions? And the audience just looks at you. Think, yeah, I'm not going to say anything because what if I've got an idea that they don't have and that'll give that away to them or what if my question is stupid and they think I won't win the contract or th those sorts of things. We we've had that problem. Now what social media allows us to do and what we've been doing on, the, on our blog is to provide a way of first of all releasing everybody, everything to everybody. We don't have to just have an email list which we've established and email it to people. We just say here it is up on the blog. We put it on Tender as well, which is the way we um, are required to release things. But on the blog we say, here it is, this is what we're thinking about doing. We'd like your responses about what we could do to improve this. Here's our draft head agreement. And we did this for Data Centre as a Service. Understand you can provide all the comments that you want now. But once we settle on the head agreement, we're not negotiating individually with agencies, with, uh, with um, suppliers. That's the head agreement. If you want to join the multi-use list, which isn't mandatory by the way, if you want to use the multi-use list, join the multi-use list, you've got to sign this head agreement. You had your opportunity to consult and comment, that's fine. If you want to use it, use this head agreement. 
and we've found that's very successful. There are a number of ways that you can provide feedback. You can provide it as some companies, and even some large companies now, are doing on the blog, saying, well, actually, we think this, and this is a challenge, or this is what we need to do, and this is how it should, could change. Or we always have an email address where you can send comments back and say, you know, we don't like this bit, or this is a problem for us. What we don't want to do, obviously, is go to market with a tender to find we're trying to buy something that doesn't exist. Or worse, that what we do essentially is absorb risk as a consequence of specifying something that people can provide, but it's so far off their normal offering that they, you, suppliers, build a lot of, and I fully encourage this, of course you would, build a lot of risk management into it and increase the cost for us. So we're looking for comments that say, do you realise that 80% of these services are perfectly fine, but just by specifying this one thing, you will increase the cost of what it is you're buying government by 10 or 15%. And if you could do with Without that, you'd actually get a better result. That sort of feedback, those sorts of comments are very important to us and we're keen to use that new technology to get them. Finally then, let me get back um, to where I, essentially I started with the logical approach to this. One of the first things I discovered when I became the um, procurement coordinator on the 4th of February um, was that I was responsible for handling complaints about procurement. And indeed, in the first week, my team um, brought to me a complaint from a vendor about a procurement. And I think, I'm thinking to myself, John Grant, not that John Grant, the other John Grant, John Grant didn't tell me about this. Um, at, how many of these will there? And I said to them, how many complaints have we had like this that the procurement coordinators had to handle since it was started in about 2010? Four. I'm thinking, well, that's all right. Uh, what's the explanation for that? Obviously, we're doing government procurement really, really well, and no one has anything to complain about. And the team all agreed with me, as of course they would. Uh, then I sort of proposed, well, perhaps there are one or two other alternative explanations, the sort of the, the challenge of alternative universes. Um, one of those is that we've actually hidden the complaints mechanism so successfully that people don't know it exists or can't find it if they want to complain. And we're going to, to address that possibility on our procurement blog when we launch it soon. We'll have an ability to make those complaints a little more obvious. Now, always when you have those things, the first port of call is going to be the agency that's doing the procurement because they're the ones that have handled it. And the complaint that says, you know, I didn't win, well, that's the nature of competition. You, you, you don't. It's not like primary school these days. Not everybody gets a ribbon. Um, the, 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 the challenge that we've got is to make sure that we do things fairly and equitably and openly. So we'll deal with that. Now, the other possibility, of course, is that people say, if I complain, uh, nothing ever happens. And I want to address that too. Now, again, I'm not saying that we'll always change things, that we'll always be able to satisfy people's complaints, but I do promise that we'll investigate them, not in the, you know, knocking on doors in the middle of the night and dragging off to court investigation, but we'll look at what's happened, explore with agencies what's gone on, and if an agency can't deal with something, then we'll do what the government wanted us to do in setting up the procurement coordinator role um, and address those issues. Now, the final possibility, and the one I think worries me the most, is the notion that people don't want to complain because they think somehow this will be held against them in the future. I want to strongly emphasise, and remembering, of course, I would say this, but I want to strongly emphasise the, the notion that I just think that's wrong. I think the way we do procurement these days, the amount of probity and legal advice we have wrapped around these things, the, the requirement we have to treat everybody equally makes it almost impossible for us to favour particular vendors or suppliers if we wanted to, let alone disfavour the ones that we didn't want to do. I don't know if you've seen a, t a government tender evaluation, but they're done in significant detail. We look at a whole range of factors all the time. Even if my staff who were assessing a tender had a problem with a particular vendor, I would know that the probity team, when they reviewed the results, would draw that out. When I looked at it, because often it's my signature, I would want to draw that out because I'm the delegate and I don't want to get into trouble. 
When the internal auditors look at things, and that happens all the time, they would have concerns about those things. And if they didn't, when the ANAO, the external auditor, looked at things, they would have concerns as well. So I don't think it's possible these days, realistically, for there to be the sorts of concerns that would say, if you made a legitimate complaint or raised a legitimate question, that somehow you would be disadvantaged in the future. I don't think that's true. Now, that said, if you go on like a lunatic, um, obviously there's, you know, we can have some doubts about what's happening. If you're not making an evidence-based claim, if it isn't logical or things like that, then we're going to have to treat it um, you know, w w with the sort of evidence that you put into it. But I do think that if you've got legitimate concerns, or even if you just want to ask questions about the process, the ability to do that through the use of social media and, and the sort of blog things that we'll have in place reasonably soon will allow you to do that more often and more easily. And I certainly would encourage you to do it. As I said at the outset, we understand that the environment is changing and we need to work with suppliers to get the outcomes we want Want, particularly in IT, because if we don't work with suppliers to get the outcomes we want, the business will work with the suppliers to get the outcomes the suppliers want. And that isn't good, I don't think, in the long term for taxpayers or for government services or in reality for suppliers. I'm now happy to um, take questions if you have any. Yep. Um, uh, John, the, is there a mechanism um, on the tender responses for tier two consultants? but tier two and three players to find each other um, if they need to do kind of a collaborative response? Uh, so I think that's an interesting question. Um, the, there isn't a formal mechanism to do that. The sort of... Um, um, you know, mating agency view of, of how government might do procurement makes that relatively difficult. I, I think instead um, you ought to rely on the sort of um, eHarmony version, which is the um, Collab IT. Um, so in, in the ACT, we have Collab IT, a joint function of this, the um, ACT government and um, AIA Canberra. Um, I was speaking there yesterday morning, a couple of hundred of SMEs involved there who do get together and work on things, and I think that's a useful mechanism for doing it. We do see a lot of tender responses that are sort of a prime and then you know, tier two or tier three providers underneath them. Um, so I think you've got to be in a position to talk to the primes as well and make sure your product is, is known to them. But we don't have that central mechanism at the moment. I was actually impressed, I was looking at the, the other slides before I plugged the iPad in um, and saw that list of P of adding your services to a Queensland <laughs> government directory um, for IT and I sort of file that away, I think that's an interesting idea um, and maybe there are some things that can be done there. But, but you, wouldn't, you might not know that the, um, the department with all the letters, um, I-I-C-C-S-T-R-E, something like that, um, has um, an in industry responsibilities and we have an ICT small business advocate, um, Don Easter. Uh, again, a bit of um, searching in your favourite search engine will find Don and the work that he's doing and you'll be able to see his YouTube in which he um, promotes um, from time to time the services of particular um, SMEs, uh, what they can do. So I'd encourage you to look at that as well um, as a means of, uh, of industry development. Any more? John Rostio from Imantra. Uh, we're listed on the DCAS, Software as a Service, um, and it's going steady for us. I won't say strong at the moment, but it's going steady. I'm surprised to see an RFT come in, pretty much a full-blown RFT, the other day with mum written all over it, and it proceeded to ask a whole lot of questions that have already been answered. You know, the, the, uh, the mum's pretty open to promote stuff, where it's hosted, the SLA, um, you know, a whole lot of information there. It, it seems as though we've gone to the trouble of listing all that on the mum and then are having to answer, go back to a, a traditional RFT process. Um, and in fact, what they're looking for, I doubt, will sit within the commercial constraints of the model. So I'm just wondering, is there enough education out there with the smaller agencies as to how to properly use the model? Do you want to say quietly, because no one is listening, whose tender it was? It was a federal government... Uh, wasn't me, was it? FMA, no, it wasn't. That's good. 
Um, so we've got a, an interesting challenge with the multi-use list. A multi-use list isn't a tender. So when you're, when you're established to a multi-use list, um, it's under particular circumstances and you can use a multi-use list to do sort of pre-qualified tender work. But it isn't a tender and the multi-use list itself as currently structured is for deals of $80,000 or less or one year or less as you know. So people are going to have to do some of that work um, if they're doing a tender or it's going to cost more than that. We're looking at a couple of things to improve that. Um, I'm thinking as to what we would do to the data centre as a service multi-use list to add um, a second tier of head agreement or, or, or an addition to the head agreement that would deal in a tender as the consequence of some tender activity with um, contracts for more than $80,000. Because we are under pressure from, from agencies and suppliers to say, well, actually, we want to use mechanisms like this to get bigger deals. So we're going to look at how we can do that. Um, some of the feedback for the data centre facilities panel, um, the, the feedback we've just gone to market then, has also suggested that purchasing large, a, a mechanism for purchasing large, larger cloud or cloud-like services is a useful thing to do, uh, and we're looking at that as well. Um, the, as, as you've said, the, the turnover on the multi-use list is um, solid, but, but I wouldn't say strong at the moment, but it is only a new mechanism, um, and we are seeing increasing uh, interest in it. My view, of course, is that you know, if you don't try new things, then um, you're just going to be stuck doing what you were doing previously. So I've been um, prepared to try something new and to see how that works, and I want to try and improve that over time. Um, and, and as you say, educating agencies is one of the ways that we'll um, do that. Any more? G'day, John. Stuart Beale from Funnelback. Um, back in the day when I was uh, a, a federal public servant, leading up to sorry, leading up to uh, election time. I know there's generally a blue brief and a red brief that's getting done. Um, I think most people in this audience will be probably interested in the blue brief at this point in time. I'm just wondering, um, what's, what's your understanding or hearing of, of what the coalition policy might be around ICT in, in the federal government space? Um, ideas, initiatives, thoughts, those sorts of things, principles even. Um, if, if you, um, I work for the, the I work for the government. Whichever government it is, um, I have no views on what um, the opposition might do. Um, I work for the government. The um, caretaker period doesn't start till August the 12th. If the election proceeds on September the 14th, and that's what the government has said will happen, um, we will prepare incoming government briefs for um, both sides. And given um, what occurred in the 2010 election, where we published, or finance certainly, and other agencies published their briefs without going through the FOI process, um, we'll probably do that exactly the same, and you'll be able to um, read what occurred. Now, there's another one over there somewhere. Just, just a quick question. When you, you spoke about the benefits of, um, sorry, spoke about the benefits of a centralised procurement policy. Um, do you ever see that happening nationally? So, uh, in, at the moment, we've got federal, federal, or states doing exactly the same process. Wouldn't it make more sense to have a centralised procurement policy for Melbourne, Australia, and then bank people in the other states, uh, <coughs> pretty much do other things better, better in the community? I reckon if the federal government could make people in the states do things, they wouldn't be starting with IT. Um, the, the, uh, we, we, all our IT coordinated procurements are available for use by the states and territories, with the um, minor exception of the Microsoft VSA, not the, the LAR contract, which is usable. Um, and that's because largely the, the structure of the VSA was around guaranteeing a set of numbers. Um, where we've got something that doesn't guarantee numbers but works on quantity and those sorts of things, um, you can use those already. Um, and we're also looking at the other, in the other procurements for which I'm responsible um, to see whether we can extend them to states and territories as well. Um, the direction on coordinated procurement says that we should do that uh, unless it slows the process down unreasonably or incurs um, additional cost for the Australian government. Um, so, so we have those things open. It's a question of whether the states and territories want to take them up. Um, you'd recognise, of course, that although the federal government is a very large buyer of IT, the, um, particularly the larger states' um, education departments are probably um, as large 
or certainly of very much the same order of magnitude um, as those um, arrangements and different um, IT companies make different arrangements for them all the time, some of which are more favourable than the best arrangements we could get. Okay, thanks very much.